hi everyone so based on our uh, community poll um, most of you wanted us to cover 5g massive mimo so today that is what we will do we understand that 5g massive mimo is a, a pr pretty complicated uh, topic it is complex it is uh, confusing most of the people talk about massive mimo uh, they talk about theory about it uh, but they're not really sure what's going on and uh, it's more of a, of a term that we use but many times we're not aware how it works and uh, we're not aware how uh, the gains that it brings upon and uh, what are its uh, complexities so today what I will do is that I will um, cover that I will I will explain what ma massive MIMO is and I will go through the practical aspects of it rather, rather than the theory of it so after going through this uh, you should be aware exactly uh, what massive MIMO is what is beam forming and uh, how it brings up brings upon all the gains so let's start with our 5g massive MIMO made simple so firstly let's understand what is normal MIMO so if we have uh, old antennas like we had in LTE uh, we had 2T2R which means two transmitters two receivers so if this is our antenna and this shows one TX one RX and this shows second TX second RX so we can say that this is a 2T 2R antenna so what it can do is that if it has 2T 2R it can use a 2 cross 2 MIMO so it means that you can have uh, two layers of MIMO so if single layer you can get 75 Mbps so with two layers you will get 150 Mbps so this, this is something that is more legacy type antennas these are used in lower bands for coverage type concepts then we have 40 4R so you can see four transmitters and four receivers here so with this one we can use 4 cross 4 MIMO so if this with this one we can get 150 Mbps with this one we can get 300 Mbps so uh, just an example uh, how uh, we increase our capacity when we increase our MIMO so MIMO as you know is multiple input multiple output so now what is massive MIMO so over here I have put a unit which has 16 TX and 16 RX so we call it a 16 T 16 R unit now um, it is open to interpretation but in most of the common um, nomenclature or most of the common uh, scenarios a 16 T 16 R and higher unit is called a massive MIMO unit because it has so many transmit elements that it has a massive number of transmit elements so we call it massive MIMO so anything above 16 T 16 R like 32 T 32 R 64 T 64 R or if you have 128 T 128 R that will be massive MIMO so 16 T 16 R is also a massive MIMO unit and when you have uh, so many transmit elements you can actually do beam forming so uh, this is how we say that uh, a massive MIMO unit will have more gains in comparison to the legacy 2 T 2 R and 4 T 4 R so um, another concept would be how many layers of MIMO can we get with 16 T 60 R 16 R so it is not 16 it is still 4 cross 4 now why we still have 4 cross 4 because the, for the MIMO layers there is a, a dependency on the UE side a UE right now all the commercial UEs they only support 4 receive layers so even if we have 16 transmitters here we can still only do 4 cross 4 MIMO but with massive MIMO what we can do is that we can do 4 cross 4 MIMO for instance for multiple UEs at the same time so what happens here is that let's say if uh, as an example as we used if we can do 300 Mbps with this um, 4 cross 4 MIMO then with 4 UEs using together 4 cross 4 MIMO at the same time our cell capacity will be 4 times that so even though this user is still getting uh, 4 cross 4 MIMO and 300 Mbps 4 users getting it together will be increasing the cell capacity by 4 times so what is happening here is that the peak throughput might not increase in comparison to a 4 cross 4 T 4 R uh, against a massive MIMO but the cell capacity will increase massively and that is what we have 
in massive MIMO. Now, um, another aspect of this would be where to use, uh, let's say, a 2T2R, where to use a massive MIMO system. So that you can also see like this. Uh, if you have suburban areas, rural areas, areas which are not densely populated, you can go with 2T2R. If you're looking for cities, you can go with 44R. And if you're looking for cities uh, which has very high rise buildings like skyscrapers or, or people have are living in uh, very tall buildings, or you're talking about hotspots like stadiums or other hotspots where you have lots of traffic uh, generated, then you use massive MIME over, over there. So that is the a simple overview of what is massive MIMO by definition and where do we use that. Now let's understand um, what are um, the further complexities about it. So when we have um, a normal antenna, let's say we have a 2T2R or 44R, so the beam that we generate from that is more like this. You can see that it covers a wide area. It is a wide beam. But when we add more elements to the to the antenna array and we go towards massive MIMO, so more elements we add, the beam gets narrower and it gets more directive and it gets sharper. So you can see that if I have this kind of a low number of antennas, a low number of transmit elements, I will generate a beam which is a bigger in shape, has more beam width, but it is not more directive. While if I put keep on putting more antenna elements, then by their phase differences, by uh, putting phase differences between these elements, I can generate a much sharper, a more directive beam. So now what, um, how this can help? Let's see. If I use massive MIMO and I use a low TX RX, let's say a 16 TX, 16 RX type of antenna, I can use beams like this. So they are, you can see I can use multiple beams. In comparison to this one, I can use a lot of beams. So if I use a massive MIMO unit that is much bigger in size, let's say 64TX, 64RX, 64T, 64R, then I will be able to generate much more beams. And these beams are more sharper. They are more narrower and they will have more directivity. So in short, as we add more antenna elements, our beams get sharper. And if they get sharper, that means we can generate more beams in the same azimuth. For instance, if this is the coverage of the cell, let's say around 60 degrees. So here I am generating around six beams to cover 60 degrees. While here I am generating around, let's say 12 beams to cover the same 60 degrees. So if I have more beams covering the same azimuth, that will give me more beam forming gain. And that is what the massive MIMO provides us. It gives us more gain. Now, um, let's have a look at it um, from the gain perspective. So let's see. Um, this is, uh, let's say, a normal beam, which is for a 2T, 2R, or a 4T, 4R, which is not a massive MIMO unit. It will look like this. So uh, the UEs that are beyond this beam will not be getting good coverage. But if I put a massive MIMO unit here, what, what will happen? I will can generate beams now like this. So these beams, because um, I can focus my antenna's power in a, in a much narrower direction, it will have more directivity, so I can generate much uh, bigger gain. So if I have more gain, the beams will have more coverage. So what it means is that I can extend my coverage using beam forming. So if this user is now able to get this beam, uh, it previously it was not able to receive this beam because it was covering a much longer distance. So um, now if that is the case, so we can say that uh, because of this, we have increased our beam forming gain. And that's, we can say we can increase our beam forming coverage. So with massive MIMO, we can actually increase our coverage as well as capacity. So let's have a look at uh, the capacity aspect as well. Now, um, if we have a normal scenario where we have uh, normal radios, 2T, 2R, 4T, 4R, then the UEs that are here in the area where they have overlap between cells, they will always have interference. So for instance, these three UEs, because they are in the overlap of two cells, 
so the beams are overlapping here right so we have interfered zone so this will always have more interference their SINR will be lower here they will have lower throughput but if we put massive MIMO units for these three UEs then for instance this UE will get this beam this UE will get this beam and this UE is getting this beam from this sector now the beams from other sec these two sectors are not overlapping that means that there will be no interference and that means that our SINR for these UEs will be higher and we will have better throughputs so in massive MIMO radios because we are directing our beams to specific UEs it is not uh, spreading over a wide range so our interference between the cells will also be lesser that means that if, if one city has massive MIMO units or let's say one cluster has massive MIMO units it will have overall a much better CQI because of less interference and also because of the beam forming gain that it will provide because the beam each beam will be more directive it will give you more uh, gain it will be uh, a better in your coverage and your quality so overall you will need lesser number of uh, massive MIMO units to cover the same area compared to the uh, same number of uh, to the same when you put the same um, uh, area and you put um, legacy networks and legacy 2T 2R or 44R units so that is one thing that massive MIMO really helps with now to understand how this works out how does the UE know which beam it needs and how um, okay for that one uh, the UE needs to tell the, the G node B about CSI feedback so the CSI feedback is something that carries three entities one is the rank indicator other is the CQI the channel quality indicator and the third one is the PMI pre-coding matrix information the PMI is the most important one here because the PMI feedback tells the G node B uh, which beam it should allocate to the UE so how does the UE get that now UE reads the CSI RS and CSI IM these are reference signals channel state information for interference measurement and channel state information reference signals that the G node B sends to the UE the UE reads them and based on that the UE finds out the PMI now how it does that for every um, configuration there is a fixed number of PMI codes now uh, let's take an example so if we say that if the UE for the particular configuration UE has four PMI is available so what it will do is that it will get the signal apply all the four PMIs to the signal and it will check the SINR of each output so let's say it takes signal applies PMI code 1 and it gets SINR 1 then it gets the signal same signal it applies PMI 2 3 and 4 and it gets SINR 2 SINR 3 SINR 4 now among all the SINRs it will compare it will find out which SINR is the highest so in this example let's say if it finds out that SINR 3 is the highest then what it will mean is that it it will mean that it will uh, send PMI code 3 in the feedback to the G node B and also this SINR it will convert it to CQI because every UE has a SINR to CQI conversion table so based on its uh, own conversion table it will convert SINR 3 into the CQI and it will send that CQI value as well along with the PMI feedback to the G node B and based on this the G node B will find out which beam the UE should get now um, again this might be a bit too much so let's look at it from an example perspective so let's see I have three UEs here we have a blue UE an orange UE a green UE and we have these number of beams here so what it what will happen is in a very simple word this blue UE will tell the G node B in CSI feedback that I should get beam number two so the G node B will start scheduling be its data on the beam number two similarly the orange UE might choose beam number four the green UE it might choose beam number 10 and all of that is sent by the UEs in the CSI feedback to the G node B now this is how uh, the feedback works but again it's not as simple as that the PMI is made up of mainly two components one is called I11 
other is called I12. Now I11 is the one which tells you about horizontal beams and I12 is the one which tells you about vertical beams. Now what does that mean? Let's, let's look at it from the perspective of uh, an XY table. So let's say this is my X axis, this is my Y axis. So X axis is lo more like the horizontal axis or the azimuth axis while the Y is the vertical axis. So the X axis in the PMI indicates I11 while the Y axis in the PMI indicates I12. Now if there is a UE which is on the ground let's say and it is moving from left to right and it comes let's say here so it will send uh, the PMI feedback as I11 is equal to let's say this point is I11 5 so it sends I11 is equal to 5 but I12 is equal to 0 so this is what the feedback would be and based on that the G node B will allocate it a beam. Now let's say it enters a building and it takes an elevator and it goes to the top floor here let's say so again I11 did not change so the the UE will send I11 is equal to 5 but this time the vertical axis has changed so it will tell the G node B that I12 is equal to 6 so G node B will know that now it will have to make a new beam which should be at a different angle because now it has found out that the UE is no longer at this location but at this location. So basically the feedback from the UE in the PMI can tell the G node B where to transmit the beam and which beam to allocate. Now um, again it might be a bit difficult to understand to grasp so let's have a look at it from a real life perspective and let's see how does it all sum up. So let's say I have a car here this is my massive MIMO unit so this one over here uh, is sending I11 is equal to 11 I12 is equal to 0 so the G node B will allocate this beam now let's say if it moves from here and it goes all the way here now it will again send the CSI feedback so over here what it will do is the CSI feedback because it has moved from here all the way here on the X axis on the horizontal axis so I11 will change let's say from 11 it will change it to 2 it's all an example to make you understand how it works and I12 because there's no vertical component it has not moved away from the cell it is only moved on the X axis so I12 is still 0 so the G node B will allocate a new beam this time which is related to I11 is equal to 2 I12 is equal to 0 now let's say it starts moving on this road which is going away from the cell now even though it's, it's still on the ground but it's moving away from the cell so uh, the angle from the G node B the angle of elevation is changing so now it sends a CSI feedback with PMI values let's say I11 is equal to 3 I12 is equal to 4 so I12 has also changed this time the, the G node B will send this beam right so it has now it will change the beams elevation angle as well to make sure that it reaches uh, this this UE which is moving away from it so let's take another example so if my this UE is sitting on the ground floor of this building it will it is sending I11 is equal to 15 and I12 is equal to 0 so you can say that I11 11 was here right so if you move away from here you should see I11 is equal to 15 so if you move away in this direction I11 is reducing so somewhere here I11 can be 0 and if you move this way I11 is higher so it is just an example it can be other way around as well but just to uh, make you understand how the PMI and the beam forming works so in this case the G node B will allocate this beam here now if this UE again it climbs up to the top floor over here then it is using the same I11 because it has not changed anything on the X axis so I11 is still equal to 15 but I12 has changed because it has moved vertically upwards so G node B now needs to generate a new beam which can change the elevation angle to make sure that this UE still gets the appropriate coverage and appropriate appropriate data rates so it will generate a new beam for I11 is equal to 15 and I12 is equal to 6 so that's how um, the beam forming gains can be seen now if it was a normal radio it will always be same the beam will always be same around here this UE moving away or this UE moving up will not be able to get the same coverage 
only the UEs which are in the bore site will be getting the coverage, while the UEs that are along the um, other axis, for instance, in these angles, they will not be getting good coverage. They will be beyond the beam width. So, while with beam forming, what we're doing, we're doing here is that every UE is getting the most appropriate beam and the most appropriate coverage. So, the massive MIMO units will give you much better coverage, much better quality, and much better uh, throughputs. So, th and this is what we need, right, for the massive MIMO. Now, another aspect to it is the multi-user MIMO. Now, what is that? Let's understand that we're using the same example that we used before. Now, here we have a blue UE, an orange UE, and a green UE. So, blue UE was using beam number two, orange UE was using beam number four, green UE was using beam number 10. Now, when the, the G node B needs to send data, it will send them like this. So, this is my time domain, let's say my symbols, and this is my frequency domain. So, let's say uh, my resource blocks. So, the G node B will schedule them, let's say uh, the orange UE gets this data, 20%, while blue UE gets, let's say, 30% and the green UE gets the 50% data. So, they are, will be split on the frequency domain. Um, I already covered the frequency and time domain um, structure in previous videos. If you have not seen that, do see them. I think that will be easy for you to understand. Now, um, if you understand that, so the G node B needs to partition uh, the resource blocks in frequency domain so that it can allocate uh, different resources to all the UEs. And this is what we call a single user MIMO. So all of them, like I said, this can be using 4 cross 4 MIMO, this can be using 4 cross 4 MIMO, this can also be using 4 cross 4 MIMO, but they are all using different number of resources. So this gets 50%, this gets 30%, this gets 20%. So if, if my total capacity, let's say, is 100 Mbps, then this UE is getting 50 Mbps, this UE, the blue UE is getting 30 Mbps, and the orange UE is getting 20 Mbps. But with the beam forming and the massive MIMO, we can use multi-user MIMO. Now, what is multi-user MIMO? Let's understand that with this the figure. Now, this is what multi-user MIMO is. So what I can do is that I can use multiple UEs and pair them together and give them the same frequency and time resources. So, for instance, over here I can pair blue UE and the green UE. So, I can see this portion which is blue and green now. So, both of them are using the same frequency resources and they can get 80% resources now. So, instead of 50 and 30 split, they can share these resources because they are on different beams. So this UE is getting beam number two and it's getting the same number of same resource blocks and same time domain uh, str um, symbols while on the green one it is on another beam beam number 10 so it is also getting the same resource blocks and the same time domain symbols so their resources are exactly same but because they are on different beams they will not interfere with each other and if they will not interfere with each other that what it means effectively is that their single user capac uh, their capacity has increased. So, let's say the green UE was getting 50 Mbps before and the blue UE was getting 30 Mbps before. Now, both of them can use the 80% of the whole resources. So, both of them can at the same time get 80 Mbps each. So, the green UE throughput increased, increased from 50 Mbps to 80 Mbps. The blue UE's throughput increased from 30 Mbps to 80 Mbps and the cell throughput it also increased. So, it can, 80 plus 80 is 160 plus 20, 180. So, the previous cell capacity was only 100 Mbps. With MU MIMO now, the cell is getting 180 Mbps. So, with this way, we can increase our cell capacity using multi-user MIMO. And if there are more UEs and more beams, we can increase it further. So, the cell capacity can increase more if there are more number of beams and there are more number of UEs. Now, why didn't we uh, pair blue and orange as well? Because they are too close to each other and their beams will have interference. So, if there are UEs that are very close to each other, let's say it's using beam 2, this is using beam 3, then if we use the same frequency domain and time domain resources, then they, because of the beams are being very close to each other, they can interfere with each other and instead of improving throughput, 
can we can decrease the throughput because the, both the UEs might not be able to decode the data. That is why with multi-user MIMO, we need some separation between the UEs to ensure that they are using beams that are much, much farther away and then they do not interfere with, with each other. So if, if there are more number of beams, let's say if I have um, 200 beams, right? So that means the beams will be more uh, directive they will be more narrower in that case maybe this UE was getting beam number 10 and this UE was getting beam number 50 so in this case uh, beam number 40 for instance then what will happen that they will have more separation between the beams and then even then they can also be paired and then maybe we can use all 100% of the resources between these three and then we can increase our cell capacity to 300 Mbps right so that is how um, we can increase our um, throughputs, right? So uh, this is how the multi-user MIMO uh, works. And this is the, one of the most important aspects of uh, massive MIMO and beam forming. And that is why when we talk about hotspots and uh, areas which have lots of traffic, congestion, we can use this massive MIMO units. They will increase your cell capacity because they can use multiple beams they can use multi-user MIMO, they can increase your uh, cell capacity because the overall CQI will be better because the beams will have low interference, the SINRs will be better, and the coverage will be better because of the beam forming gains that they pro that will uh, that the beam provide. So all of them together, the massive MIMO um, in itself is uh, going to give you a big boost. And for the same area, if let's say you need 10 sites, 44 are uh, to cover the same capacity in this in one area you might only need four massive MIMO sites to cover the same area so even though massive MIMO units will be more expensive uh, they will you will need lesser number of massive MIMO units to cover the same area to fulfill the same capacity in comparison to the normal 2t2r or 44r units so that is some of the basics about Massive MIMO. There are still more concepts related to that, which I will cover in the second session of Massive MIMO. We will talk about how we find out how many beams a particular configuration has, and we'll find out how to optimize Massive MIMO as well to get the best throughputs. So um, stay tuned. If you like it, please uh, do subscribe, do share with your colleagues, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.